Hello and welcome to the Your Parenting Mojo podcast. I know that a lot of parents worry about the stressors that their children face, and I even know of families who postpone experiences that they think their children may find traumatic, like divorce, to protect the children. But what kinds of experiences are actually harmful to children? What kinds of harm do these experiences create? And how can we support not just children, but all people, so they can live their fullest lives? That's what we'll look at today, and we'll discuss it with perhaps two of the most qualified people out there on this topic. So Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris holds a bachelor's degree in integrative biology from the University of California, Berkeley, a medical degree from the University of California, Berkeley, and a master's in public health from Harvard University. She was the founding physician of the Bayview Child Health Center in San Francisco, where she saw the connections between her parents' difficult life experiences and their health. She also founded the Center for Youth Wellness, and her very readable book is The Deepest Well, Healing the Long-Term Effects of Childhood Adversity, and beginning in January 2019 and then ending in February 2022, she also served as the state of California's first Surgeon General. And also with us is Jackie Tu Huang Wong, who is Executive Director of First Five California. Ms. Wong holds a Bachelor of Arts in Social Welfare and Psychology from the University of California, Berkeley, Master of Social Work from California State University, Sacramento. She's worked as an advocate for equity, health, education, and to eliminate poverty among children, youth, and families in California for over three decades in roles such as the former president of Policy and Advocacy at Grace, a private nonprofit dedicated to reducing child poverty in California. She is trustee of the Washington Unified School Board in West Sacramento and is a professor for California State University Sacramento's nurse credential program. And I also just want to add a note before, before this episode gets underway, and I welcome them, uh, which I actually did on the call that we were on. Um, I found out moments before this, uh, this recording was made that I, the, the PR team that had reached out to me about interviewing the guests had not passed on all of my questions to, <laughs> to the guests. They passed on just the highest level questions and not the background research that I like to cite so that my guests know in which direction I'm going to actually take the, the conversation. So it was... A little bit disturbing to me to find that out in the moments before we got like we went live um, and to have to deal with some administrative stuff so I was a little bit disoriented as we went into the conversation and um, because we also had a hard stop we didn't get a chance to ask all the questions they really wanted to get into so sort of consider this as a, an appetizer to whet your appetite for these questions which I know we're going to be talking about here on the podcast for a long time to come so here we go into the conversation so welcome Dr. Burke Harris and Ms. Wong as well Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. Yeah. And so I wonder, maybe we can start at the beginning here and get on the same page about what an adverse childhood experience is, is right? What, what is this idea of where did it come from? Yeah. Yeah, I can jump in and answer that. The, the term adverse childhood experiences comes from this seminal research that was done by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, and Kaiser Permanente. And this study was published over 20 years ago now. And in it, researchers asked over 17 and a half thousand adults about their ex at about 10 categories of experiences of stressful or traumatic events that happened in childhood. So these included physical, emotional, or sexual abuse, physical or emotional neglect, or growing up in a household where a parent uh, experienced uh, mental illness, substance dependence, was incarcerated, where there was parental separation or divorce or intimate partner violence. So these are the 10 categories of uh, events or experiences that are counted as part of the adverse childhood experiences. And the reason this research was so profound and impactful is that they found a couple of things that are really important. Number one is that ACEs are incredibly common. So two thirds of folks had at least one and one in eight individuals had experienced four or more adverse childhood experiences. Another key finding was that there was something that we scientists call a dose response relationship. So that means the more of these categories of ACEs that someone had experienced, the more likely that they were to have um, poor health outcomes related to things like not just some of the stuff you'd expect, um, like I think for depression or anxiety, for many of us, that makes intuitive sense, but where they 
also saw a very strong relationship was between ACEs and heart disease, between ACEs and Alzheimer's, autoimmune disease. And so that really helped us to understand that what happens early in childhood sets the foundation for lifelong health. Yeah, it's kind of wild when you think about it, right? That you can actually track from one to the other. And yet, then you think, oh, yes, but of course, why wouldn't it? <laughs> um, and, and so I was curious that that uh, a lot of the early research very much focused on these family level indicators, right? The the things that are happening within the family. And Dr. Burke Harris, I know that you did some, some research to expand the, the pool of things that we're looking at as we consider ACEs. Can you tell us about that work? Yeah, so one of the things that we understand is uh, so, of course, the, the question that came to mind was like, how does this happen, right? Especially for me as a physician, I'm trying to prevent my patients from having adverse health outcomes. So what we now understand is that uh, when we are exposed to stressful or traumatic events, it actually activates our biological stress response. And when that stress response is activated in a repeated way or a severe way, it can change the way our body's stress response is wired to respond to subsequent stressors. And that can actually affect children's brain development, the hormonal development, their immune system, and even the way their DNA is read and transcribed. So that is what doctors now refer to as the toxic stress response, this prolonged activation of our stress response. And when we understand that, we recognize that ACEs aren't the only thing that can lead to changes in our biology of stress. So there are other factors like experiencing discrimination or being separated from a parent through deportation or migration. So things like that, what we now understand is when there's a stressor and there's somehow an inability of uh, there's not adequate buffering caregiving because what we understand is that the real powerhouse in this is that parents, caregivers, other stable adults in the life of the child have the capacity to help to regulate that stress response through their nurturing care. And in absence of adequate nurturing care, that's when it leads to long term health challenges. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so. I, I guess, you know, to, to put all of this co in context, what I'm thinking is, is why, why does this matter, right? What kinds of impacts are we looking at here? How big are, is, is the potential scope of what we're talking about? Well, it matters profoundly for health and well-being. An individual with four or more adverse childhood experiences, when compared to someone who has experienced zero ACEs, is at twice the risk for heart disease, the number one killer in the United States, four and a half times the risk for depression, um, you know, over uh, 12 times the risk for suicidality. So we see there's a profound impact. And when we look here in California, where we have really taken steps through the Stronger Start initiative and other initiatives in California, um, the annual cost, the annual cost of the state of California is $112.5 billion per year from adverse childhood experiences. So we recognize that preventing and treating the impacts of adverse childhood experiences is something that's in all of our interest. Mm, yeah. And, and also, we're kind of at a period of time where... I mean, the incidence of of many, uh, you know, traumatic events are, is much common, much less common now than it was 100 years ago, right? People dying in childbirth is is way less common now, um, like 98% lower over, over the last 100 years or so, of course, not evenly over all populations. Um, you know, motor vehicle accidents are down, infectious diseases are down. And so I'm just trying to figure out from a historical perspective, was just everybody walking around traumatized 100 years ago or... Um, did we just expect to have a, you know, a relatively short life? And so it wasn't so traumatic when it happened, right? How can we reconcile this idea with the fact that so many of these, um, you know, these, these deaths are, the, the death rate is declining. Um, and yet we see so many ACEs because we're having such a hard time dealing with all this. Well, what a wonderful question. So first of all, you know, it's a big challenge because 
we didn't have the data. Like the ACE study was published in 1997. So there's nothing to compare it about. Again, we don't know if ACEs are going up or going down. What we do know is that since the ACE study was published in 1997 and California really started um, tracking this data on a statewide level in 2009, the state of California, including first five California, has taken bold steps to do public awareness and prevention so that in the future, right, when we're comparing those numbers of is it going up or going down, we can see those numbers going down, right? Because that's what Stronger Starts is all about. It's about arming parents and caregivers with the information they need to be able to be that buffering care for their, uh, for the the young people in their life, for their child, for their grandchild. And what that means, I think a lot of us don't recognize this, is that for many of us who have our own ACEs, right, addressing our own histories and and really doing the work of self-regulation so that we can be that safe and stable place is something that Jackie and I have talked quite a bit about <laughs> around how we can do this and and yeah. provide those supports and best practices. Yeah, maybe we can maybe we can go there for a little bit then because I know that we're, you know, a lot of the families that I work with um, sometimes there's one parent who's doing a lot of the work, right? I mean, in a, in a patriarchal society, it's very often the mother who's the one doing the research on parenting approaches and who's trying to heal herself so she can show up differently for her children than the way her parents were able to show up for her, given the tools and the traumas that they had. Um, and, and maybe her co-parent isn't necessarily on board with all of this. And is like, well, I just want to parent like intuitively. And I think I turned out fine and my parents spanked me. So what's the problem? Um, and so I'm wondering, can you speak a little bit to that buffering, right? The, the effects that maybe one parent can have, uh, on, on the children in a, in a family, in a relationship and, uh, and, and how that can help the children potentially. Yeah. I mean, it's one of the reasons that we, um, work together, Dr. Brooke Harris and I started the Stronger Stars campaign. And it really is about helping parents um, help their children when they go through these, these challenging times, right? I, I, I want to emphasize that we this is a fairly new research study, right? In the late 1900s, if you will, and the tools may not have been there when we were growing up. And so we are really excited to kind of bring forward this, this massive campaign to really just elevate the conversation. So when you know better, you do better, right? So we know that difficult times are imminent within families, whether it's divorce or migration or separation from parents, mental illness and, or violence in communities and the like. Um, and we know that for children, those these actually, these experiences can be traumatic. So um, we've come up with four specific, I love them, the four Bs, right? That uh, are the specific interventions that are easy to remember, right? As we kind of are going about our days, um, be calm, be steady, be there and be nurturing, right? The first one is, again, taking those deep, kind of those beats, we take a beat as we rush through life, single parent, as you mentioned, or like you feel like you're a single parent, um, is that, okay, let's be calm, let's be present, because we know that children feel everything um, that we feel. And sometimes we are also uh, triggered, if you will, from our own trauma. But again, this is a tool that we know that we can create a buffer against ACEs by creating safe, stable nurturing relationships and environments. And the first one is to be calm, be present, and be steady, creating those routines that may not have been there when we were going through um, our our events um, when we were younger. Um, Be present, be there, right? Spending the time, even those five minutes of joy, hugging, singing, dancing. Um, And the third one is to be, we we know that when uh, we are nurturing to our children, we nurture ourselves, right? When we pour into our children, that has a healing effect between the relationship, the deep relationships that we are building with children. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And all of that makes absolute sense in terms of I know all of the the research that I've done over the last years with with podcast and I guess what what I'm coming back to is is talking with parents who say things like I know those things and I'm on board with those things and I 100% know that I should be doing them and then when my kid does something and it just pushes my buttons and I just, my mind goes blank and I can't remember any of the tools that I'm supposed to use, any of the things I'm supposed to do. What would you tell parents who are in that kind of situation? Yeah. And I'm going to go back to the four Bs. The first one is breathe, take a beat, forgive, you know, kind of take those, that space. That's why our first one is to be calm. Right. Uh, And again, um, 
pushing boy buttons is a normal thing. That's happened when I <laughs> I've parented, right? And so we've created kind of really simple, kind of memorable tools of just it's okay to step away, right? To to kind of find that space so that again you can go back into your steady routine and pace, right? Um, and helping your child as you actually are connecting with your child of they are feeling a lot of different emotions in different environments. Um, and once you kind of take that breath, exhale and take the beat, able to actually work through those emotions, what that child, what your child is experiencing, whether you're a grandma or your auntie or you're parenting or you're a, you're a, a caregiver for that child is okay. It's okay to actually, but to recognize that your button is being pushed is that first kind of step to saying, okay, I, this is happening. It's normal. My child is going through something and I need to step away for a sec, for a sec, but I, and I will re return. Right. And sometimes that's just taking those 10 seconds, five seconds to breathe. And can I, can I jump in here? Because I think that one of the, one of the important things about a campaign, like the stronger starts campaign is that, so this is a real story. I was in, I was actually in France and I was taking a, taking a class, doing something to nurture my joy. And um, uh, one of the women who was there was a woman who lives in LA. And I was just telling, we were chatting about what we do. And she was like, oh my God, I saw that billboard. And it got me thinking, she's a single mom. And she was like, it really got me thinking about what my reactions are and how I respond mm -hmm. to my daughter when she is, you know, driving me crazy. And I think that's the intention, the intention, like we know, cause I, my husband and I have four boys. Okay. So like being perfect in the moment every time mm -hmm. is not going to happen, but what it does. And this is the great thing about a public education campaign is that it gives us the opportunity to think in those moments when we're not triggered or not upset or not like, Oh, wow. How am I doing? And I think it's the same thing for the parent where you have someone who is most likely to be the mom saying, hey, I think this is really important. And then you have the other parent saying, oh, I'm just intuitive parenting. And it's like, it's just a reinforcement, right? It's that regular reinforcement. So at least that that mom has the opportunity to say, oh, honey, did you see the billboard? <laughs> like, it's not just me. I'm not crazy. <laughs> Actually, you know, being calm, being steady, being present, being nurturing. It, it sounds like that's a thing. Like we, you know, we could do more of that in our household. And then it also connects to resources, right? So families can go to first5california.com and they can look at, you know, get more tips, right? About how to do dragon breathing with their kids and breathe it all out, right? And get <laughs> some of that frustration out. Stuff that is helpful for kids, but also helpful for us as caregivers. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you mentioned resources, right? And I think that that's a really important point on this. And, and Dr. Burke Harris in, in your book, The Deep as Well, I, one of the anecdotes that really stuck out to me is the perception that we have culturally that this is an issue that people of low socioeconomic status face, right? And and the, the story you mentioned in your book is, well, you know, in, in the poor families, we just kind of, we everybody knows who the molesting uncle is. In the rich families, we just don't talk about it. <laughs> it's still there. All of the same crap is still there. We just don't talk about it. I wonder if you can speak a little bit to the ways that it shows up in families with different access to resources. Yeah. So I think that what we see is that for our families with the most limited access to resources, it's it, the challenge can be overwhelming in part because there are fewer choices. So I've definitely cared for families where there were there was horrible things going on at home. And the question was, do we stay in this situation or do I take my kids and go out on the street, right? right? So, so which is worse? And sometimes if there's a, a household situation where there's physical abuse, um, then that makes that decision clearer. But if it's mental or verbal abuse, right? 
then we can the the choice can be okay well we'll just figure out a way to take it or deal with it when it turns out what the science shows and what the biology shows is that it the the impact on our health right emotional and psychological abuse can be just as damaging on a biological level as physical abuse and so these are we we definitely see that i think that the chal- the, the on the flip side right On the flip side is that what we see in upper income families is that in upper income families, there's more to lose, right? Mm -hmm. And so this this perception, the the desire to make everything seem like it's fine um, often leads families, the reputational risk, the all of that stuff can lead families to, again, not say anything, not seek help pretend like everything's okay. And I think um, what the what the research is showing us is that safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments of, in, are an important buffer. So they're not, they don't just feel good. They literally change our biology down to the cellular level and even to the DNA level. And so that ability to seek help and ask is is what allows us to be able to access those safe and stable and nurturing relationships. And that's another thing that we, you know, that was another goal we had with the Stronger Starts campaign was to let people know, hey, this is important. Safe, stable and nurturing relationships are healing. And if you need help to get access to that, you know, here are some California.com. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) We need our own billboard flashing across the screen. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so I guess, I mean, that that makes me think of, uh, you know, a lot of the data that we have on ACEs is correlational in, in nature, right? So that we know these two things vary together. We're, we're pretty confident in that. Um, and I'm curious about how close we are to causal data and knowing, knowing that ACEs cause negative outcomes rather than being two things that just vary together. What do we know about that? That's so great. I'm so glad you asked this question. So I think we're there. I think we are there. So in um, the California Surgeon General's report on ACEs, toxic stress and health, um, the we actually used the criteria. So there's a set of criteria that called the Wilson and Youngner criteria for all the public health nerds out there. And they really deter- they help us assess whether or not something is causal. So it's not just, is there a dose response relationship, which the ACE study gives us that data, which is population data about, right? But we actually took, um, uh, so the team at the California Surgeon General's office actually looked at the molecular data, right? Like, does this happen? Do we see evidence of this on a molecular level? Do we see evidence of this on a clinical level? What happens, is there, uh, for example, experimental data, and much of that data, unfortunately, is done in animal models, but there are some, just as unfortunately, or perhaps more unfortunately, that are in in human uh, models as well, where we look at populations of individuals who, for some reason, that are comparable, and then for some reason, one group of them has some severe stressor, right? Or one of the really... um, uh, uh, well-documented studies was uh, children who were in Romanian orphanages, and they actually randomized them into high-quality nurturing caregiving. So they kind of did the opposite. Kids would experience adversity and randomized them into high-quality nurturing caregiving. And what they saw was that the kids who received that high-quality nurturing caregiving, actually on MRI, they could see changes in the structures of their brains uh, following the, you know, several years of receiving this high quality nurturing caregiving. So the data is there on a molecular level, on a clinical level, on a, uh, what we, what we call the physiologic, the way the body systems work. And then that where what the ACE study does is it's one piece of the puzzle that gives us great data to say, okay, now we've looked at ACEs in more than 24 countries and the, the relationship is consistent. 
So we are at the point where um, we can make a, a statement of causality. Mm, okay. Um, and so I had done, I spent a fair bit of time <laughs> looking at the research on this and um, not challenging you, just looking to get your thoughts on some of the things I had read, right? And um, obviously this is a fairly new concept. So we're not, we, we don't have detailed longitudinal studies yet. Um, and so it's it's hard for us to tease out whether there may be some sort of spurious correlation with something else that's that's happening that, that we don't know of yet. Um, and I guess that, that also leads me to sort of the, um, not necessarily always being sure of what precedes what, right? Like, so if we think of a mm. child who might have ADHD, um, maybe uh, there might be, uh, you know, th th that child may have a difficult relationship with their parent. And we're, we might not know if, uh, you know, if the, if the parent then comes to believe that that child is oppositional, is defiant, is difficult yeah. to parent, um, and, and potentially, you know, does some things to the child that, that we might, uh, hope wouldn't happen. Um, you know, did the ADHD come first? Did the, did the trauma come first? Did the difficult yes. parenting come first? Right. All mm. of it seems so tied up together. So yeah. how, um, I'm curious, how can you be so sure that this is a cause-effect cause relationship with all these oh, other that's, things going that's on? That's such a great question. I'm so glad you asked it. So there's a, there's a, um, there are a couple of ways in which we understand. So first of all, uh, that chicken egg cycle that you described certainly can exist. And I've seen it I, countless times in my clinical practice. But when we're talking about longitudinal studies, I think one of the great example is the Dunedin study that uh, uh, the Dunedin study that they did in New Zealand, where they actually did do a longitudinal study. They started with individuals at birth and they followed them forward, and then they identified the individuals who somehow throughout their life course were exposed to trauma, adversity, maltreatment. And then they looked at um, a number of markers, but that's actually one of the the studies where we got the best data around the impact of early adversity on inflammation. So they tracked some of their molecular inflammatory markers and they found that individuals who had, the, they've been following everyone, right? But they, so we do have some data from longitudinal studies. Um, and the way I think that the, to your point, and I just want to make sure that I'm, I, that I'm, satisfying you by speaking to your point directly <laughs> is that if you take any one study individually you, it's always that's all of science no good scientist would take one study individually and say we are drawing a conclusion from this yeah but when you look at the as you know i and my team did uh before and as the surgeon general like when you look at 20,000 studies right and you use the criteria to say, okay, are there experimental models where they take individuals and then they expose them to adversity and then they see what the outcomes are? That obviously would not be ethical in humans, but they have done it in animal models and they have seen the, so for example, one of the great studies was the one that was done at McGill, uh, university looking at the rat pups, right? Where they the, the pups were born, they exposed them to a stressor with lots of handling and, uh, you know, lab assistance. And then they looked and saw those, um, those rats had poor cognitive functioning, poor executive functioning. They actually measured their physiologic stress response and found that that stress, physiologic stress response was, was more overactive and that it had a more difficult time bringing itself back down to the set point, or it had a difficult time with feedback inhibition, right? Which is interestingly, much of the similar things that I've seen in my patient population. And then they actually, are you familiar with this, the study where they, then they took, they found that that adversity in rat pups was actually associated with uh, DNA markers, so epigenetic markers. These are markers that sit on top of the genome. And then this is the cool thing that they did. This is why I love science. The neck, and that these, these markers were handed down from generation to generation. So they found that the, the, the rat pups that got a lot of stress 
And some of them had moms that did lots of nurturing care, right? So coming back to nurturing care. And then some of them had moms that didn't do very much nurturing care. And the ones who got lots of nurturing care, they did better on executive functioning. They had a more normally functioning stress response and all those things. And then the next generation, and they found that that functioning was associated with certain epigenetic markers. And then the next generation, they switched them at birth, right? And then what they found was the, the rats that were raised by moms that had lots of nurturing care, they, they behave, perform better on cognitive tests. They had a more normally functioning stress response system. And when they, you know, when they looked at it, their genetic markers were that of the mom who reared them, not of the, their biological mother. Right. Mm. So this is where we take all these pieces of data and scientific evidence and say, hey, we're seeing this clinically. What does this um, but is it consistent? Is there what we call in medicine and science coherence between the population data like the ACE study and a study where you're actually able to, you know, put a needle into the brain of a rat and look at their uh, you know, hippocampus and, and, and look at the functioning and see the DNA markers that are on there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that answer. Yeah. So, so any one study is not necessarily going to, to give us the picture, but the, what you're saying is the preponderance, preponderance of the evidence is pointing us in that direction. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, and of course you bring up the intergenerational trauma as well. Right. And, and that this, this can and is passed, passed on through generations and, Gosh, I mean, I, I'm putting myself in the shoes of a parent who is struggling themselves at the moment and, and seeing the intergenerational transmission coming down, right? Maybe I was parented in ways that were suboptimal and um, and maybe I exploded my kids as well. And so maybe, you know, I'm I'm not parenting in, in these, you know, calm, steady, connected ways. What, what uh, should I feel bad about this? Should I like wh what can I do to uh, when when it is so hard for me to uh, to not always be on and be calm and connected um, to to know that I'm not like damaging my kids? Yeah, what a what a great question. Um, it's really what our campaign is about, right? Stronger Starts really says that we all experience um, an ACE or a trauma. And um, it's okay. I mean, failure is not the right word, right? It's not about failure. And I think it's not, I think sometimes people think parenting is a, it's an all or nothing game. It's definitely a process and relationship building with, with your child. Um, and even though there's epigenetics, we also know based off the research that Dr. Brooke Harris was just citing is that we can buffer against the, the impacts, right? Even though there is a kind of epigenetic factor uh, uh, related to ACEs and toxic, to long-term toxic stress. It's it's the tools that we are saying like, okay, um, when you see the bill, we're like, okay, like there is a, a way to buffer against, protect my child against kind of these negative effects that may be actually in in my parenting style. Um, but the the first, very first step, this is why it's so important and why we were, um, they, you know, Dr. Burke Harris and I were so just overwhelmed when we kickstarted this um, campaign back in March here in Sacramento was like, do you know what it can do when we're just doing this major public education campaign to make people aware of that? It's, you know, it's what happened to you. It's not who you are. And it doesn't have to actually really affect your, your child. Again, um, in our focus groups, we have learned that um, people of different generations, we've done grandpas, grandmas, like different cultural backgrounds, that people have a sense that they all, every single focus group that I've been on or that I've seen, is that they know that the way that they they grew up isn't necessarily kind of how they want to raise their grandchildren or children. When we're really struggling or when we're blowing up at our kids or when yeah. we recognize that because of how we were parented, we really struggle. And I feel like that is where understanding ACEs has been really helpful to me because mm -hmm. I recognize for myself as someone who has experienced ACEs, Oh, oh, that's why. You know what? I was, here I am, this doctor and pediatrician, all this stuff. Why do I struggle so much? Why do I have a such a hard time when my kids are, you know, doing X, Y, and Z, right? And I recognize, oh, I'm, I, I need more help. I actually need more support. 
because of what I've experienced in my own childhood. And so that really allows me to also give myself some grace. And that's what I would say to anyone in that situation. You can actually take that understanding of your own history and use that as an opportunity for self-compassion and then recognize, okay, this just means I need a little extra support. So let's figure out how we're going to get that. And I I would also say like, as a parent who I'm going to confess, has raised my voice and my children, (laughs) okay? That step one, right, is you can give yourself some grace, right? None of this is about doing it perfectly. But when we have the information, hopefully that's a little bit of extra motivation for us to, to say, you know what? I recognize that I probably need to get my workout in because- when I'm, when I'm healthier, my kids are healthier, right? So that's also an opportunity and hopefully a little bit of a motivation for some self-care and just mm-hmm. no one is expected to get it perfect. And um, by the way, I, I would say that, you know, being short with your kids, you know, one time is, is not, it's not going to give them heart disease. <laughs> the point is, the point is, when we talk about being, being calm, being connected, doing those things, um, if we just have some intentionality around that, that helps anything, any, any awareness or any little incremental step that we work, that we apply to try to, okay, well, let me just try to maybe do a little better than I would have done otherwise. Right. Mm-hmm. The the hope is that the information is not there to make parents um, feel badly about what they're doing, but hopefully to inspire and raise awareness about uh, what they can be doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and that kind of brings me to a question that came from a listener who spent a lot of time thinking about these kinds of things and uh, trying to relate the experiences that she had in childhood to what are considered, you know, societally speaking, the, the good kind of parenting, right? Dr. Diana Bohmrein's work. And I, I always forget if it's authoritarian, authoritative. <laughs> Remember, authoritative. Which the Thank authoritative. you. Authoritative, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Why couldn't she have called them something different? <laughs> so you can actually remember. So I can remember. Um, so so the the authoritative, the good kind, right? Dr. Bowman was a huge advocate of spanking. She published a number of papers advocating for spanking. Um, and Dr. Andrew Grogan Kaler has done a lot of work on this and came on this show and, and told me he thinks spanking should be an ace. Um, mm. You know, the use of shaming is a standard parenting tool. And, uh, you know, her parents were were not alcoholics per se, but they were using tools like alcohol and shopping and, you know, those kinds of things to self-medicate from the hurts that they'd experienced. And so, um, you know, what she's trying to figure out is, you know, that it seems like there's this huge gulf between an ace of hitting so hard that it leaves a mark and trust and belonging, which is where we all mm. want to be, right? And, yeah. and the kind of parenting that you're advocating for through this program. And so when, when this most common cited way of parenting, the good kind of parenting advocates for all these tools that I personally believe are really harmful to children, like how, how can we get far enough toward where it seems like the three of us think that we want to go? So, I mean, I wanna be clear that um, as one of the things that I I love about the Stronger Starts campaign is that it's based on the latest research. And let's keep in mind that science evolves over time. So I don't know if you've ever, as a public health person, I spent a lot of time researching just what effective public health campaigns have been. And I think we forget that like in the 1930s and 1940s, doctors were advertising cigarettes. I'm just going to say it, right? It was like literally a picture of a doctor in the magazine with a, with a cigarette, you know, in their mouth, right? And um, and then we get more information, right? We get more information and then we realize, oh, you know what? We had said that, but it turns out that the, the science no longer supports that. And I think it's a similar thing with spanking. Like, I grew up in a culture of spare the rod and spoil the child. This is what there's. And by the way, corporal punishment is still like legal in many states in the United States, right? For like 
teachers to be hitting kids. Mm -hmm. And the science has advanced. And the science now tells us actually, you know what? That's not helpful. In fact, that can harm children's health. I know that we grew up with it, but the, now that the science has have advanced, we're going to advance our practices. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you <laughs> for confirming <laughs> where I, where I think we should be going. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it's just hard when you're consistently seeing Dr. Baumrein's work constantly cited as this. This is what good parenting looks like. It's the authoritative kind, and it looks like this. And yeah, it's it, it's. I find yeah. it frustrating to to that we aren't further along in that journey. Yeah. Dr. Wong, I was, sorry, Ms. Wong, it looked like you wanted to say something. <laughs> no, no, Doc, I've been promoted. All of a sudden I've been, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, no, I was saying that's that's the magic of this campaign, mm. right? That hopefully our, the research that we ha we know that poured into this campaign will be cited more often than that research. Yes. Right, we're just awesome. beginning. It's only a couple of decades, like I, it just, we know it innately. Like we're talking, having this conversation, you're saying, I wish everybody kind of knew this, but I, I look back like it's just, it's only been a couple of decades. And this mm -hmm. campaign has only been a couple of years to put out in the world. And I have absolute faith that as this campaign evolves and grows, that our research will be cited more, mm -hmm. right? Just like, I love the kind of, I, I love the smoking analogy, Dr. Brooke Harris says, that's exactly right. We didn't know the research said something else different and we get to put different and more modern and evolved research out in the world about parenting. And so yeah. I'm just so grateful for this campaign to be in this, uh, to have this opportunity to have this conversation with you, right? Okay, and so um, we will continue to, to do our research. We will continue to bore, pour money into this so that we can actually begin to change the environments that we're having these parenting conversations in. Again, that's why a public, health campaign around toxic stress response and ACEs is just so transformative um, for the next generation and beyond. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And I, I know that um, uh, Dr. Brooke Harris, you've done a lot of work on screeners. I'm wondering, is, is there any aspect of screening in this campaign or is, is that completely separate from it? Like what's, what, how, how do you think about screeners as a useful tool sort of practically? On a, on a on a level of understanding what's happen actually happening for an individual child. Yeah. So um, the the Stronger Starts campaign is part of a statewide response to understanding the risks that are posed by adverse childhood experiences and toxic stress. And First Five California, which is the champion for supporting. Uh, children zero to five and their parents and caregivers is, you know, taking the lead on doing this public education to let families know the importance of safe, stable, and nurturing relationships and environments. The, the Office of the Surgeon General and the Department of uh, Healthcare Services has led another initiative to educate physicians so, and healthcare providers about the importance of ACE screening and also improving access to care for individuals who have, uh, who are identified as having significant ACEs and being at risk of having a toxic stress response. And so that has been an initiative that, that we poured um, resources and research into it. It's being led by UCLA and UCSF two of the leading health centers in the world. Um, and also the, um, uh, the, the governor's office, uh, the, the precision medicine uh, in, initiative. So there is a, a, an initiative within, um, from a research standpoint around California's initiative to advance precision medicine that is also focusing on the research, looking at um, a screening and identifying toxic stress and looking at biological markers for toxic stress. So different areas. We also have um, within the state of California, a, a huge investment on children and youth mental and behavioral health that is really focused on also providing those supports, building that infrastructure to be able to support children and youth who have experienced ACEs, but also other mental and behavioral health challenges as well. 
And so we're really taking this multi-pronged approach. There's also an initiative um, called the Safe Spaces Initiative, which is educating uh, uh, educators, right? So our educators and our childcare providers about the role that they play and being that safe space for our children. So when we have the data, when we have the science and the evidence, it's just like, and I think smoking and tobacco is a really great example. Like, yeah, so first we said, you know, smoking in bars, you can't do it anymore. And everyone was up in arms like, what? Yeah, how can you not smoke in a bar, right? <laughs> and then they were like, smoking in airplanes. Remember that? Remember the smoking no, section I, on the airplane? My first like, trip to the U.S. was <laughs> yeah, tours exactly. in front of the smoking section. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly, right? We're like, okay, we're not going to allow that anymore. And then we say, oh, you know, tobacco, we're going to tax it, right? So there's never just one approach to addressing a public health problem. It always, in order, in order, if you want to be successful, right, you have to address it from multiple arenas. And so California is supporting our healthcare providers on understanding ACEs and toxic stress and responding appropriately. It's helping our parents and caregivers understand ACEs and toxic stress and respond appropriately. It's helping our teachers and our educators and those in the educational environment understand the issue and respond appropriately. And it's supporting our researchers to advance the science because everything that we do is based in science and research and the best possible data. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what you're reminding me of is the idea this, this is not just a problem between parents and children. This has a much broader context within our culture. And if we don't look at it through that broader context, then we're going to miss things that are really important. And we're not going to provide the support that parents and families really need. Um, and so I think that that kind of brings us towards our conclusion. So we're, we're sort of experimenting a little bit here in the new year with a, with a different format to our conclusions. And, and so I had, I had offered uh, some details that hopefully made it through to you <laughs> um, on, on the format of this conclusion. So what I would like to try to offer to parents is um, the, a, a mild option, a medium option, and a spicy option based on the things that we've mm. talked about today, right? Like if you are, um, if, if you're hearing about this, maybe you've heard about it before, uh, and and it's just it's, but it's still fairly new to you. Like, wh how could you dip your toe in the water if just being calm seems very far out of reach, right? If you're in, if you've heard a lot about aces, you understand what they are, you're looking for a more advanced practice. We're kind of, you know, what's the spiciest option that we? How far yeah. can we push this? And where is yeah medium in between what would you leave listeners with for three different ways they could engage depending on where they are with their understanding of the concept yeah i'll start with a mild option come visit first sure. california.com learn more about our strong <laughs> starts and campaign we have a lot of tips and tools i would actually say um the mile the also mile they're actually you can actually explore our website and go to the other websites that dr brooke harris said to the office of the surgeon general and the research is there so I would say uh, that's my mild to um, non-spicy. Okay, I forget the the mild to the mild medium works. spicy. Yes. Mild. <laughs> <laughs> option. Um, okay. And Dr. Brooke Harris is the expert in this. So what is the spicy option? Which I love this framing. I absolutely, um, I absolutely yeah. love this framing as well. Oh wait, do I only get to offer spicy? You or can do. I you know all of them, all of it. <laughs> okay. Have yes. a medium and a spicy. Okay, so um, medium option, and I um, I really want to be intentional about not being self-promotional. So I'll say go to the library and check out the deepest well. <laughs> you, like, I don't I don't want people don't need to buy it. But I think learning more, right? Learning more about understanding about how early adversity affects. So that would be the medium option for those who are uh, ready to go there. And then the spicy option would be talk to your healthcare provider. And um, if, 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 you, if there's something of concern or something that comes up in this conversation that you are wondering about for your own family um, and you, as, as a parent uh, or a caregiver, I would say talk to your child's uh, provider, healthcare provider. I think if you're an adult, um, you know, one of the things that's really unfortunate is that we are working on 
training and arming uh, adult medicine physicians to uh, with this information, with these resources, but the work and the resources much further advanced in, um, in pediatrics and family medicine. So I don't want to tell anyone, like talk to your doctor and then their doctor doesn't know anything about it. But I would say there might be, if there's something at first, uh, firstwifecalifornia.com or uh, another great resource is, is numberstory.org where you can just uh, get a little information that you can bring to your provider and say, you know what, I, I want to talk about myasis and I want to get support in actually breaking that intergenerational cycle in my own household. That feels spicy. That's a spicy. Yeah. Spicy. Yeah. yeah. And, and presumably, I mean, this, that could have a couple different approaches, right. From a, a mental health perspective, like I want to mm -hmm. actually get support right now. And also potentially from a physical health perspective, if you're going in for a physical, yes. right. If you have access to healthcare um, and, and letting your doctor know that, that, I mean, this is a risk factor. This is a, this is a risk factor for certain kinds of, of illnesses. So that's right. And it really your doctor should be able to support you. And if they, if they haven't done the res, if they don't have the resources, they don't, don't know, they can go to acesaware.org and learn more, take the training, get all the resources that we have there for healthcare providers. I, I will throw in my mild option, which is an option that I love. And I feel like it's maybe the bread and butter option is for all of us, our own support system, right? Just take a little moment and think about how we can shore up our safe, our support system. So who are our safe, stable and nurturing relationships and whether it's a walk and talk with a girlfriend or, um, you know, connecting with someone who you love and trust or someone who has always been a source of support in your life, that is a great place to start. Just shoring up our own support systems so that we can, because we don't, you know, none of us does it alone. Yeah. We, we, you know, we know that we can't do it alone. And so supporting our own um, support systems is a great yeah. start. Yeah. Our own safe, stable, nurturing relationships. Yeah. Because we all have experienced this at some level. Yeah. And we all need it, yeah. right? Like we all, like in, in case anybody was wondering, like I'm feeling like they had to go it alone or they had to be the solution yeah. or they had to be a superhero. You know, the good news is that science tells us that like that is a myth. None of us can do it. We need support. We need partnership. We need others to lift us up. And so the, the um, to the extent that we feel safe and that we have, even if it's one person, like the science shows for, for kids, one safe, stable adult can be enough to help to prevent that toxic stress response. Similarly for us as adults, even one safe and stable and nurturing person in our lives can be enough to begin our own healing journey. Yeah. Yep. And maybe reserve a moment for anger at our Toxic white supremacist patriarchal capitalist culture. <laughs> we'll save that for another episode. <laughs> and nurture ourselves for the moment. So thank yeah. you so much for being here, yeah. for sharing this research with us. I jotted down all the websites that you mentioned. I will gather them all up, especially the first five California that will be at the top of, uh, of the list of resources we gather. Um, all of the 20 papers that I read for this episode will be referenced on um, the episode page as well, along with Dr. Burke Harris's book available in libraries and in bookstores, local bookstores, and on websites named after rivers. Um, that book is um, the deepest well. And so all of that information can be found at yourparentingmojo.com forward slash ace. Mm -hmm.